Thanks for joining us here at Faith. We hope that you are encouraged and challenged by today's message. If you'd like to learn more about Faith, our campus locations, and how you can stay connected, check out faithishere.org after this video. Hey, good to see everybody here today. Uh, so glad you came. Great way to start your year in church. And uh, what an exciting time to come. Hope, how many went out of town, had some vacation time, and saw family and all that kind of good stuff? I know you had a great Christmas and great New Year's Day. How many found someone to kiss on New Year's Eve? All right, yeah, I did, and so that's, uh, that was, was my wife, by the way, so just in case you're curious. Uh, but anyway, we're glad you're here. Uh, take your Bibles out, turn to Revelation chapter 1. Some exciting things going on. We are in the search process for a campus pastor for our Monk's Corner campus, and, and also a discipleship pastor for right here, uh, for all, really all of our campuses. And so pray with us about that. We're getting, I think, very close, and we're excited about what God's doing. Also, just kind of an update, in the next two to three months, we will finish at Walterboro, and we're excited about that building. Thank you for giving to Kingdom Builders. Thank you for help making that possible. But we're about done. It's gonna be an amazing sanctuary right in the middle of Walterboro, and we wanna reach that, have a greater impact in that area. And then also our Ridgeville campus, is finishing up as well. And so we are excited about that right on Interstate 26. God's blessed us with an amazing location. So we are so thrilled about what God is doing. I'm, I'm, I'm pumped about this series, uh, Vision 220. And uh, we're going to talk about what we believe God has for us, has a specific vision right here for Faith Church. Now, you guys know our values to know God, grow together discover your purpose, and make a difference. And so as we look at each one of these visions and begin to unpack them, they will center around those themes. And so we'll be kind of tying that in. And today is to know God. And so I hope that you will get a brand new revelation and a sense of who Jesus Christ is. And I think as we start the year out, we center on the Lord and get our focus on him. It changes the way we do life. It changes the way we worship. It changes the way we do family. It changes the way we do everything. But it all starts with the revelation of Jesus Christ. So let's all stand together and let's look at Revelation chapter 1 and we'll begin with verse number 1 today. The revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to the servant John who testifies to everything he saw that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Jump down to verse number eight. And I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's pray. Fathers, we begin to open up this incredible book today. I pray you will open up our hearts. God, we stand in awe As we see this revelation of who you are, I just pray you'll help me. Help me, Lord, to bring it forth, to make it clear. Open up our hearts to receive what you have for us. May everything we do center around you, Lord Jesus. And we give you glory and honor and praise today. We thank you for your sweet presence. And we ask it all in your mighty name. Everyone said amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I think when people talk about the book of Revelations, uh, Revelation, they, they, they mistake it and call it the book of Revelations, plural. It is actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is the central person, the central focus of the book. It's, it's, it's why John wrote the letter. He wants us to get a revelation. He wants to see who Jesus Christ is very, very clearly. And I think sometimes we're afraid of the book because we get lost in clouds and smoke and fire and beast and horses and plagues and vials and bowls and all that kind of other stuff. And somehow we, we kind of avoid the book of Revelation because we're just kind of afraid of it and we don't understand it and we can't make sense 
sense of it, but we've got to first understand primarily it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so John, the, the word revelation is apocalypto, and, and we get our word apocalypse from. It's kind of like you're sitting in a theater and you're waiting for the show to begin, and all of a sudden the curtains are pulled back. And you sit back and you just enjoy what you're about to see and witness and be a part of. And so, so what is happening is, is John is literally pulling back the curtain and revealing in a greater way who Jesus Christ is. Incredible book. Now, the problem we have with our study of the book of Revelation is that we look at it from Western eyes. We are, we are products of a Greco-Roman society, and so we're Westerners in our thought process, but we don't understand that, that the Bible was written from an Oriental or an Eastern kind of concept, Eastern kind of thought, and so it's a, it's a kind of a totally different language, and sometimes it makes it a little challenge or difficult, especially in the book of Revelation, to understand what he is saying, language, and how it translates and how we interpret and how we receive it is is very very unique i uh i grew up uh a product i was grew up in the 60s listened to the 60s music in the 70s i'm a product of good old-fashioned rock and roll i mean i just like the rock and roll music sorry about that guys if it if that disillusions you but that's the way i grew up uh, but the one music genre i couldn't really get into was country music how many country western music fans we got here raise your hand don't be ashamed oh i see you. you're all over the place we we got you picked out you're in you're in the country music and and uh, i just never could really get into it uh, about about 30 seconds of Tammy Wynette is all I can take. But, uh, but, but the words, you've got to hand it to country music fans. The words are simply poetic. It is sheer poetry. It's, it's, it's romantic. It's, uh, it's exciting. It's, uh, it's, it's heart-wrenching. So ladies, as I begin to give you some of these words, take your handkerchiefs out now because you may just break out into tears hearing some of these real words from country songs. Here's one. He broke my heart at Walgreens and I cried all the way to Sears. <laughs> Here, the true words. I'm not, I, I, her teeth were stained, but her heart was pure. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Just what a picture. Here's another words from a country music song. How can I miss you if you won't go away? <laughs> uh, Here's one, and how, how, many, how many mechanics in the room? You guys like to work on cars? You may wanna try this with your ladies. I changed her oil, she changed my life. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? And then uh, here's one, and guys, I hope you're not singing this song around the house, but part of the words of this song go, I wouldn't take her to a dog fight because I'm afraid she'd win. <laughs> And uh, here's one. This is one of the older country songs, I think from the 1940s. It says, Mama, get the hammer. There's a fly on Papa's head. <laughs> and and uh, one more I'll share. It says, uh, my wife ran off with my best friend, and I sure do miss him. <laughs> So, so the, the words in country music can be intriguing, uh, uh, passionate to say the least, uh, uh, heart-wrenching, but they, they, they were, came out of a culture of a society and a social uh, economic background or a period of time, and thus the birth of country music began. And so when we study uh, books like Revelation, we've got to understand it comes from a certain backdrop in time and place, and it's more of an of a Eastern kind of thought as opposed to a Western thought. Let me t show you the difference. Uh, the, finish this sentence for me. The closest distance between two points is a straight line. You guys are all Westerners. That's not the case in Eastern thought. Uh, we think linear. So chapter four has got to occur before chapter eight and chapter seven's got to occur before chapter 11 and we take everything in sequential order and that's the way we study the book of Revelation. That's not the way it's intended to be studied or learned. In fact, in Revelation, the Eastern view is circular in time and so they go from seasons. There's, there's uh, spring runs into summer and, and summer runs into fall and fall runs into winter and there's a dry season and there's the wet season and everything is based around the law of so and reaping or a circular kind of looking at life and you can't determine where it begins or where it ends and so it is God gives this amazing vision to John he's on this island called Patmos and all of a sudden the, the, everything's swirling around and he's all these circular visions going on around him and he sees it just kind of explodes in his face and there's smoke and there's fire and there's angels flying across the sky and cherubim and seraphim and there's horses riding out of different colors and there's all kinds 
kinds of things going on. And then the Lord says, okay, now, John, sit down what you just saw. Write what you just saw. And so he sits down and he begins to write this panoramic vision and revelation. And he begins to write the words down. And so, so that backdrop will help you. And so don't be afraid of the book. It's an incredible book of worship. It's an incredible book for spiritual warfare. But more importantly, it's a book that points to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is always at the center of the book of Revelation. It's an amazing. And then he says, write it down. Now let's look at it. We're gonna, we want it this morning is to get a bigger vision and view of Jesus Christ. Because once we get a proper vision of him, it changes the way we think, the way we act, the way we worship, the way we live. And so look, if you would, at verse number nine, and we're gonna begin there and look at this together. It says, and I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. Now. Patmos is a, is a rocky, desolate island. It's about 10 miles long. It's about six miles wide. And what they would do is the Romans would take their, their worst prisoners and uh, criminals and they would put them on this island and they would work the rock quarries. And so they're mining rocks and gravel for all the construction projects for Rome and they're mining all this and getting this out for the Roman government. So they, they work from morning till evening and they work very hard and they are beaten and it's brutal. And so John is there. He's separated from his loved ones, separated from family, separated from all the other believers. And he's really there by himself. And he says, I am here because of the testimony of the word of God and of Jesus Christ. His only crime is being a bold witness for the Lord. And now he finds himself on this desolate island called Patmos. And he begins to get this glorious vision while he's on the island. You know, your circumstances may seem bleak and it may seem like you're going through a rough time and it may seem like you're by yourself or you're lonely or you're all alone and you're going through struggles and you're going through trials and, and someone's turned against you and, and it, it may be challenged. But out of even the most dire circumstances, God can bring something good out of it. And now we have this amazing book called Revelation all because God and his divine sovereignty allowed him to spend some time on the Isle of Patmos. Good news for you in 2020. It may have been rough 2019, but listen, out of that, God can do something great and good and amazing. And then he, notice he, he, he says, look at, the, look at the very next verse. He says, and I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Here he is on a desolate, rocky, crummy island, but even in that, he says, I am in the spirit. There are actually two realms or dimensions in which we live in. You live in a physical realm, a physical dimension on planet Earth where your feet are. But I want to tell you, if you are in Christ Jesus, you live in an entirely spiritual, amazing dimension that transcends everything that is physical all around us. Aren't you glad when you're in Christ Jesus and you know him and he lives inside of you? It, may, it doesn't really matter what's going around you. I have Jesus and I have everything. And, and Paul, when he writes the Ephesians, says, I am now seated with him at the right hand of God in the heavenly spiritual realms. And so we see all this going on with, with John in the book of Revelation. Now what I want to do is over these next few moments just kind of break down this revelation of Jesus that he sees. The first is verse number 13, and it says there, and among them, uh, and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. Now, what does that phrase, son of man, mean? We, we've got to ask ourselves, where did he see that and where does he get that from? Well, to understand the language, it is actually a messianic term. It was a term that Daniel penned uh, generations earlier to describe the Messiah who would come. I, I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, look at verses number 13 and 14. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And in my vision at night... I looked and there before me was one like the son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days. The ancient of days was a title for God, God the Father, the ancient of days. He approached one, the ancient of days, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. 
All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And so you have this glorious picture of the Son of Man who is Jesus Christ, who what? Is given all authority and all power and all sovereignty. It all belongs to Jesus. Remember when Jesus got ready to ascend? We read in Matthew chapter 28, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth and, and, and the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is one that will never ever pass away, that will go on forever and ever. Jesus has been from the very beginning. He will be all the way to the very end. He is and was and is the one to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this title, Son of Man, was a description of one who would come and deliver his people or a picture of the Messiah and would rule an amazing kingdom. Uh, Son of Man's an interesting title. It speaks of the humanity of Jesus Christ. He had to be born of the Virgin Mary so he could die and give his life for us. You see, you can't kill God. But for in order to be a sacrifice for my sins, God had to become man. He had to take on flesh. And when he lived on this earth, he experienced every experience that we face in our lives. Every kind of temptation, every kind of trial, every kind of betrayal, every kind of test, every kind of heartbreak and heartache and tears and laughter and joy until it finally culminated when Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross for us. And so you have now the Son of Man in John's revelation pictured in a long robe. The long robe speaks of his role as our great high priest. And so because he was a man like us, the Bible says we have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, which means I can go to the Lord Jesus Christ morning, noon, or night and take any burden, any care, any problem and lift it to him. Isn't that good to know? That's who Jesus is. He is my, the son of man. But he also has a golden sash on which symbolized royalty. So not only is he my high priest, he is my king of kings and lord of lords and he rules and he reigns supreme. And so he is fully man, he is also fully God. He's man, he understands what I'm going through, but he's God so he can fix it. Isn't that good to know? Hallelujah. Get that revelation of the Son of Man. Second, the Bible says that he is also called, he is also all wise or all knowing. Uh, there's, a, there's a word we use in theological terms, omniscient, means all knowing. Uh, so look at verse number 14a, if you would. It says there, uh, the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. Now, when you look around, I, I, I'm, my hair is getting whiter and whiter every year that goes by. And so I'm virtually gray. We like to use gray better, but it's turning white. And so uh, for us, it kind of signifies old age. And we kind of think maybe this is what he's talking about right here because he is the eternal God from everlasting to everlasting. But white was also a symbol. White hair was an incredible symbol of wisdom. And so the Lord is our all wise, all knowing God. He knows the beginning from the end he knows every detail in your life he knows what you're going through he's our all wise God there's nothing that catches God by surprise Jesus by surprise nothing he never says boy I never saw that one coming I wow that fooled me got got one over on me here I, I never saw that there are with Jesus Christ there are no accidents There are no mistakes. He is always in control, and he knows exactly what he is doing. Jesus Christ is like that for us. Aren't you glad? Wow. He is one who is unimpeachable. I'll say that word again. Jesus is unimpeachable. I like that word. (laughs) And he's bringing every plan into fulfillment he is going to bring it to pass it is going to come to pass and he knows all that is going on and he is a wise God and the amazing thing is this this wise all-knowing God allows us to be a part of his divine plan of redemption hallelujah all wise the third thing is he is our righteous judge 
Look at 14, uh, the second part of that verse, if you would. And his eyes were bla- like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. He is able to be our righteous judge. What does it mean, eyes like blazing fire? Uh, the Greek literally means his eyes shot fire. In other words, he has x-ray vision. He sees beyond what human eyes and understanding can see. He sees to the very core of our being. He knows everything about us. His eyes shoot like fire. He sees to the very depths of who we are. You know, we, we have this persona that we only allow people to see certain part of ourselves. We let them see the exterior. We don't let them see what's on the inside. And so we camouflage ourselves, and we put on our best behavior and our best actions, our best attitude. And, and maybe we open up to a few close friends and only then a part of what we want to reveal or what we choose to reveal. But listen, you can't hide from God. God sees his eyes penetrate to the very core of our being. He knows knows the thoughts and the intents of my heart. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows what I'm filled with. He knows what my motives are, what my attitudes are. Jesus Christ sees and knows all of that. His eyes are penetrating. Uh, You also get this picture of these eyes burning like fire in context He's writing this letter to seven churches. And he is indignant over the condition of his churches. And so he writes to Ephesus. Then he says, I see your works. You're a hardworking church. You study the word. You know the Bible. But he says, I see beyond that. I see there's a heart problem. You have left your first love. And his eyes see what's really going on in the church. He writes to a church of Thyatira and he says, your doctrine's great, but you're, you're sleeping with Jezebel and you allow her to remain in your midst. And, he, and all of a sudden his eyes are penetrating beyond what anyone else can see. And he sees Laodicea and he says, you are rich and think you have need of nothing. But I say unto you, my eyes penetrate, my eyes see, you are neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. And so he sees the real condition of his churches that he's writing to and and his eyes are burning hot because of the condition of five of those seven churches that he writes to. And then he's got feet of bronze in a blazing furnace. Blazing furnace. Feet of bronze. In other words, Jesus Christ has been tried and tested in the furnace and he has come out pure. How many have ever ever heard the expression, he's got clay feet, feet of clay? Have you ever heard that expression, old expression? Nobody, just a few, wow. Okay, and so what what happens is we take leaders, politicians, stars, people we look up to, famous actors, movie stars, uh, athletes, whatever, and we tend to put them on a pedestal. We take pastors. If we're not careful, we'll put our pastors up on a pedestal. And then we have those times of carnality where we blow it or we mess up or we make a mistake. And then we say, well, I guess he just had feet of clay. In other words, he wasn't all as perfect and as great as we thought he was. He has simply feet of clay. He is human. He's going to make mistakes. He's going to blow it at some time or another. Listen to me. The feet of Jesus Christ are described as bronze, as purified in that pure furnace. There is no weakness. There is no frailty. There is no imperfection in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is absolutely perfect in every way. His feet have been tested in the fire. Mm. Now, let me ask you a question. Does this image of Jesus with eyes shooting out fire, feet on fire, glowing in the dark, does that vision of Jesus Christ frighten you or does that encourage you? Uh, Let me just maybe help you out here. If you think that image of Jesus Christ frightens me or makes me afraid, it's possibly because you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, if you don't know know the Lord today as your Lord and Savior and you're not sure where you're going to spend eternity, it should bring absolute fear to your heart and mind because there is a judgment day that is coming. But listen, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ and we're in the family of God, this kind of description of Jesus makes, brings great encouragement and great comfort to his church, to us today. I, uh, there's another image of the brass feet. 
when you would go into the tabernacle area in the outer courtyard, the first thing you came to right in the middle of the courtyard was called the brazen altar, okay, brass. Now remember the feet of Jesus are like brass in the fire. A brazen altar, and what they would do is they would take an animal, they would sacrifice it for the sins of the people, and so they would kill that animal, and, and often they would take the animal and put it, not every time, but often put it on top of the altar, they would light a fire under that altar, and it would become what was known as a whole burnt sacrifice to God. Now, you're tracking with me. Jesus' feet are like brass burning in the fire. He has become my sacrifice once and for all time. He gave his life for me on Calvary. He took every sin. I should have been laid on that altar. I should have been on that cross. But Jesus Christ became my whole burnt offering in typology to give his life for me that I can have everlasting life today. And so when we see that description, it ought to make us excited this morning. That Jesus Christ came and he took my place. What a word of encouragement. Now, if you know the Lord, you love Jesus, but you've allowed unconfessed sin to remain in your life, there's stuff you know you shouldn't be doing. There's stuff you're watching at night you know you shouldn't be watching. There, there, there's, there's things that you've covered over. There's unconfessed sin that you're living a lifestyle that you know is contrary to the word of God. There ought to be a little fear brought by those eyes that are burning like fire. The word of God says, be sure your sin will find you out. And so even as children of God, if we sin and try to cover that up and try to hide it and try to remain in that lifestyle, that sin always separates me and my relationship from a holy Lord and Savior. And so the good news is, the Bible says if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so as I'm walking with the Lord Jesus Christ in relationship with him and the Holy Spirit pings me and says, hey, there's this going on and that going on. We say, God, I'm sorry. I'm your child. I never want to hurt you. I never want to get drift away from you. And we confess that sin to the Lord. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness righteousness. So as his child, I don't fear his burning eyes, but I am conscious of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I don't want to defile that presence in any way, shape, or form. And, and so I say, God, forgive me. And I keep walking in freedom and in joy and in life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Eyes are like burning, burning fire. The fourth thing is he is all powerful. The theological word for that is omnipotent. He is all powerful God. Look, if you would, again, and let's pick it up with verse number 15b, second part of that verse. And it says, and his voice was like the sound of the rushing waters. Picture Niagara Falls. Picture the tens of millions of gallons pouring over top of that falls and coming down. If you're around Niagara Falls, I had the privilege of being there once, you can't hear anything around you. The voice of God is so powerful, it drowns out every other voice. And then it says, in his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. Now, now uh, you, you, when you think of the falls, you think of the mighty voice of God. There are always voices vying for our attention. In fact, let me tell you, this week we're going to fast all week long. I'll tell you more about that at the end. But we're going to fast to center on the Lord Jesus Christ, but also to shut out the other voices that so easily distract us. Food, television, media that just kind of vies for our attention but the voice of God is mighty it is powerful and when you get close to the Lord Jesus Christ every other distraction every other voice is drowned out by the power of almighty God and, and then it says and out of his mouth came a double-edged sword now the writer John is very specific here it is a two-edged sword it, it is, reminds us that the word of God both cuts 
to the quick and the core and separates body, soul, and spirit, but it also brings healing as well. And so when Jesus Christ was born, the Bible says he was full of grace and he was full of truth. It is two sides of the double-edged sword. The Holy Spirit brings conviction through the word of God, but he also comes along and brings grace and mercy and life and healing because out of his mouth comes the double-edged sword. And and the double-edged sword is the word of God. Oh, I I wanna challenge you guys. Read the Bible this year. Make that a part of my resolution for 2020. I wanna read the Bible through, and as I read it, I open up the pages, and I say, Holy Spirit, enlighten my life. Cut out what doesn't need to be there, but also bring healing and grace and mercy. And the Lord will be faithful to do that. He is all powerful. His word is powerful. And the last description is he is my protector, my protector. Now I want you to look at verse 16 again. It says in the first part of that, in his right hand he held seven stars. Now, through this whole passage, he is giving us symbolism, symbolic liturgy. And so we've got to do our best to interpret what the author means. But when he comes to this last thing of seven stars and seven candlesticks, he is very specific about what he is talking about. And so he gives, he, he reveals the mystery. He opens up exactly what he means to say. And so jump down to verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, when you talk about strong right hand, you talk about a place of protection. It's also a place of molding. It's where he takes the right hand and he can mold us and make us into what he wants us to become and look like and how he helps us to grow. But you also think of this idea of godly protection. And so he says the seven lampstands, they are the churches, plural. Now, the letter that John writes is written to seven very specific churches. And so we like to talk about the church, capital C. Yes, I'm a part of God's church. Uh, I'm a part of, I got brothers in Vietnam and in China and South America and Latin America, and we're all a part of God's big church. And yes, that is an accurate interpretation of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I will tell you, he writes, he is interested in the midst of very specific churches. In verse 11, he says, there were, there were seven lampstands and Jesus stood in the midst of his church. That's why people who say, I love Jesus, but don't ask me to go to church are violating the intent of the word of God because Christ hasn't left his church at Faith Church. He is still right here. He is still in the middle of the church and he hasn't given us permission to leave either. It's in the middle of his churches. The middle of of Ephesus, the middle of Laodicea, the middle of Thyatira. He is still right in the middle of the church. He's still in the middle of Faith Somerville and Faith Walterboro and Faith Goose Creek. He, He still stands squarely in the middle of his church. Wow. And, and, and the picture is, is that of an oriental gardener. So think Eastern again. And so you have this image of a gardener who's in the middle of his churches and he's going by and he prunes the branches and he cuts off what doesn't need to be there and he waters the plant and he fertilizes the plants and he takes care of his crops and he, and he checks on his crops and, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he's, he's the gardener that is pruning and gardening his church, right? You, you, you got the imagery there? But because he has eyes of fire, he sees all the way down beneath the plant to the root. And so when he writes these seven churches, he gives them a word of praise, and then he gives them a word of rebuke, and then he tells them, if you'll listen to the Holy Spirit and do what the Holy Spirit says, there will be a reward for you. And he says to him who overcomes, I will do this and this and this. And so he he walks by one of his plants, and it's full of leaves, all kinds of fruit. It's in this, it's Laodicea. And he's right there and he says, man, to to, the natural eye, he says, I am rich, I am good, I have need of nothing. But Jesus with his eyes seats all the way down to the roots. And he says, you got root rot. You got a real problem. You're lukewarm. 
You're lukewarm. You're, you're, you're not where you should be in, in our connection with Jesus Christ. You're, you're away from me. And then he tells them to repent. How they can get back on track. And then he sees another church and the, and the, and the branches are battered and, and, and the winds knock the leaves off and, it, and it's just kind of barely hanging on. And it's the church of Smyrna. And he says, you know what? I see a church that is small. You have been persecuted. You have been tried. You have been attacked. But listen, I see the roots and the roots are hanging on to me. And because you're hanging on to me, you're going to make it. And you're a strong, healthy, vibrant church. You see, we want to look on the outside. We want to, but, but he has eyes that penetrates all the way down to the core of who we are. Listen to me. You don't have a right to malign or, or maul his church because Jesus Christ is in the middle of his church. And if you attack a local church, you are attacking the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. A few amens. Okay. I thank you, five, for believing me today. Mm, mm, mm. Those who attack Christ's church, who sow lies, who gossip, who create discord, will be personally dealt with by him who is in the middle of his church. There's a temptation that maybe you came from a background. I thank God he's protected us. He's kept his hand on Faith Church all these years. There's been no major church splits, no major division, no animosity. There's been no lynch mobs and trying to kill the pastor and drag him out and hang him from a tree. I'm grateful for that. Thank you so much. And we, we have a wonderful body of believers and a wonderful body here at, at Faith Church. It's amazing. But some of you may have came out of churches that were hurting, that were fractured, that there was a lot of gossip going on. You can't get along with somebody else. Maybe you came from a situation where the pastor abused his power and was financially irresponsible or morally impure in some way. And you were devastated by what you saw happen to that family right there. And, you, and you're coming wounded and limping and broken. And the, the, the first thought that can come your mind is man if that's what the church is like I don't want any part of it but listen Jesus Christ is still there still in the middle of his church it is still his institution to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ it is through the church he chose to reveal the manifold mysteries of God to the rest of this world and carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ stay in church Stay faithful to the local body. It's easy to say I'm a part of his big church around the world and never attend his local church. He says, I'm writing to the, I'm in the middle of the seven churches of Asia Minor. I am right there in each individual one. And then he, he goes on to say, I have stars in the right hand. And he says, the stars are the angels of the churches. Now in our mind, we, we might tend to, to misinterpret this verse and think there are angelic beings all around the church. Well, there, there may be. I, I, I hope there are. I hope he's got some angels in our parking lot, cut down on the wrecks and backing into each other. I don't know. Uh, around the building, that would be great. But that's not what he's saying here. The word angel means messenger in the Greek language. He is talking to seven real churches with seven real messengers. The angels and the stars in his right hand are the pastors and leaders of those churches. That's who he's talking about. He says, I hold the pastor in my right hand. And so if you are tempted to kick at the pastor or kick at your pastoral staff, or kick at the pastors at any one of our campuses. You better kick real high because we're positioned in the right hand of Almighty God. We are not hirelings. Uh, we are not here to be hired and fired and dealt with in a corporate way, but I, we are stars in the hands uh, of the Most High God. And there he protects. And if you gotta kick high enough and you think you're gonna hit your pastor, be careful because you gotta kick through his nail-scarred hand to get to him. And, and, and then, he, then he says, so the pastors don't take this and abuse their authorities as leaders over the flock that the God gave them. He tells them in verse number 19, he says, write therefore what you have seen and what is now and what will take place. My two main responsibilities are to hear from God and share it with you. I do a lot of other stuff, 
But my primary, my primary responsibility as the pastor of the flock is to hear what God is saying and then share it with the body. Don't kick, don't kick. Thank you. Go to verse 17. I'm gonna close, we're done. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and he said, do not be afraid. Everybody say that, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys to death and AIDS. You can imagine John, he, he gets this revelation of Jesus and he just falls down. He gets on his knees. He just, he just awestruck by what this revelation that he has just seen of Jesus Christ. But all of a sudden that hand comes. It's okay. It's okay. Don't be afraid. By the way, that phrase, don't be afraid, the most used phrase in the word of God, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And if you're a child of God, you don't have to be afraid of 2020. You don't have to be afraid of what's ahead of you. Listen, God is saying, I got this. I got this year. I know what's gonna happen. I am the alpha and omega. I am the beginning and the end. I, 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 I was and, and, and was dead and now I'm alive again. And when I died, I went down and I wrestled out of Satan the keys to death and hell. And now I pay for the keys with my own blood. And he says, child of God, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful of the coming year. I've got all this. Hallelujah. And I'm holding the keys in my right hand. Hallelujah. The book of Revelation. It's a book of victory. It's a book of joy. It's a book of excitement. And the, over, the, the, the one key word is the word overcomer. And he will say it again and again, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. And the good news for you is when the storm of life comes and hits you, don't worry about it. We win. We win, right? When opposition arises and people turn against you, we win. And when we find ourselves on an island of isolation called Patmos, I've got good news for you. We win. I'm the first and the last. I've got the keys. It's okay, boys. You're going to make it. We win. Mm. Listen, I want 2020, listen to me, to be a fresh revelation of the exalted Lord and the exalted Christ. Listen, every Sunday morning when you come into this place and you're gonna come every week, come, come with an expectancy. We're gonna worship God. We're gonna glorify God. You don't worry about who's on this platform, who's up here singing. We're here to exalt Jesus Christ. These guys aren't here to be seen. They're here to lift up and glorify the Lord Jesus. So come with an expectancy that we're gonna worship God and love him and glorify the Lord. Hallelujah. Focus your mind and your heart on him. Come with an expectancy and he will take us to a very sure victory. And he's standing squarely in the middle of his church hallelujah now let me just share a couple things with you and then we're going to pray in order for us to refocus on jesus and tune out all the other voices i'm challenging this entire body to fast and pray the next five days five days monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday you got it and we're going to fast and, and and for some of you it might look like a traditional jewish fast morning sun up to sundown and you may break fast in the evening for others you're going to say i'm not eating all week i can do this thing and you're going to drink liquids i drink a little bit drink some liquids uh soup whatever for some nourishment but you but you're just gonna and your stomach's gonna growl it's gonna go nuts it's gonna say i need food and you're gonna get on your knees and say i need jesus and you're gonna seek the lord and you're gonna wait on him TV, media, cut it out, push it out, just shut her down for a week and center in and get a new revelation of the exalted Lord and Jesus and get your Bible out and pray and wait on God and let God speak to you specifically about what he wants for you in 2020. And then at nights, I love January. 
We're gonna move around to our different campuses. Tonight, we're going to our North Campus. Listen, guys, we're gonna have a time tonight. We're gonna have an international service. We got the Spanish church joining us and all our other churches, and we're gonna praise God and glorify Him, and we're gonna sing and shout, and we're gonna wait on the Lord and pray and seek Him in that place, and believe God's gonna do amazing things. Next Sunday night, we'll be at Goose Creek, and the following Sunday night, we will be at our Revive Campus in North Charleston. So those are our locations. Put that in the back of your mind. Now also to help you in your week of fasting, from noon to one every day, this, this building will be open. And we're gonna come together, we're gonna share just a little bit from God's word, give you some things to pray about, and then we're gonna pray around this church. And there'll be worship music playing, and we'll sing a little bit, and we'll pray a little bit, and we'll wait on the Lord, and, and, and we'll pray with each other, and we'll join our hands and pray for America, and we'll pray for our families, and we'll pray for breakthroughs, and we'll, we'll pray for God to move, and we'll pray for revival. And so if you can join me here, if you can take lunch off and come and join us, I want you to come. If you can't, you can do something else. We're also going to put it online. So it'll be a faithishere.org, or I think there's a Facebook page that we're on. That, that It'll be broadcast live from 12 to 1. You can just watch it and pray with us wherever you're at. Or if you can't do it at noontime, it will then be archived. You can go to the website anytime and watch it anytime during the rest of the day and, and just join and pray with us and hear the thought from, from the pastor who's sharing that morning. And so you can join in as well. But I believe God's going to do amazing things in 2020, right? Amen? But it starts, it all starts with a revelation of who Jesus Christ is.